I was fortunate in that I was exposed to space at a very early time in my life because I was born and raised in uh, Hawaii. And I was fortunate not because Hawaii is beautiful and has surfing and beaches and hula dances as you may expect, but due to the fact that my dad worked here at the Haleakala Observatory. And if you've never left Boston, you may not know what I'm talking about, but Hawaii has one of the biggest, ni best night skies of the entire world. When you're sitting there and working at this observatory, you can see nebulas, galaxies, millions of stars. And sitting there as a kid and simply looking up and seeing this amazing vista over my head just really enthralled me with just the possibilities and the fact that looking up, you can do anything and be anything. And knowing that is when I wanted to know, is when I knew that I wanted to work in space the rest of my life. And I devoted to that, my, devoted myself to that. I studied hard, graduated from Virginia Tech, and right out of college, I got hired by NASA to help run the International Space Station. Specifically, I was hired as an ethos flight controller with sole responsibility in keeping six astronauts alive, breathing, and working on the International Space Station. I was lucky enough that I was able to work with 17 different countries in the biggest international engineering project in the history of the humankind. It was the greatest team of engineers ever met. And luckily enough, I was actually able to meet my wife, who worked two cubes down from mine, and she's sitting in the audience now. <laughs> And this was a big, uh, a big responsibility to put on the shoulders of a 22-year-old kid. I was hired right out of college. I was certified to run the International Space Station at the age of 24. Coming to work, I need to pass security guards, badge readers, uh, and know that if I send the wrong three commands in order, I could vent the atmosphere of the space station to space. I would kill six people. I'd destroy $100 billion worth of equipment, and I would ruin the manned space program of countries all over the world. Now, given that, I was amazingly lucky in the fact that I got to watch as the International Space Station evolved from two modules, one Russian, one US seen here, launched in 1998 to what it is now, which is the, the largest spacecraft um, ever assembled in space. It has components from Japan, Europe, Canada, America, Russia, and many other countries. Roughly, it's larger than the size of a football field. But I glossed over something. And the fact that it was built and constructed last year, we are now ready to do amazing science in space. We're doing research in life sciences, medicines, materials, but most importantly, simply how humans live and work in space. This really ties into something that I do, which is the life support systems. Launching equipment to space is amazingly expensive, and once it's there, you want to use it as much as possible. Uh, specifically, an example of this, so when astronauts go to the bathroom, their urine is, there, is then uh, processed and converted into drinking water. And that drinking water is then processed and converted into the air that they breathe. So in a very real sense, the astronauts breathe their own pee. <laughs> it's one of the less glamorous things they don't like to advertise that much. But I glossed over something that I, I'd like to talk about now. The ISS, the International Space Station, was launched in 1998. It was permanently manned in the year 2000. That means for 12 years, longer than some people in this audience have been alive, we have continuously had a human presence in space. The generation now, in a true sense, is the very first space generation of mankind. Where your parents grew up with airplanes, this generation is going to grow up with, space, with a spacecraft. And that, to me, is really the most amazing contribution that ISS has given, that people growing up are growing up in a world where space travel is not only commonplace, but just happening all around them. And part of living in space involves knowing what's out there. So let's review the solar system. Every single one of the dots that you see here is an object orbiting around the sun. And there's hundreds of thousands of them. Those red circles are objects that pass close by to the Earth. NASA tracks these objects around the solar system using dozens of telescopes all over the world, pointing up at the sky 24 hours a day, just waiting to see something that moves. And sometimes they find one. So let me point you to the gray dot in the center of the screen. That's the asteroid Apophis. It's 1,000 feet across. It weighs 30 million tons. And if you were an astronomer in the year 2004, this one sent you into a brief panic. When it was first discovered, the asteroid Apophis had a 3% chance of impacting the Earth. Astronomers around the world, once they first laid eyes on this guy, pointed every telescope they had at their disposal at it to get additional data. With that additional data, we refined the orbit of Apophis and changed a 1 in 30 chance of impacting the Earth. 
to one in about 250,000 now, or about the same as winning the lottery. There's a silver lining to this, is that I am looking forward to a worldwide increase in interest in space in the year 2029 when Apophis makes its close approach to Earth. It's going to pass so close to us, it's going to be closer than many of our own satellites. It's going to be a naked eye object, which means you're going to be able to stand in your backyard, look up, and watch this asteroid fly overhead. And especially if you're, and especially if you're somewhere on this red line, which is where if Apophis hits, if we win the world's unluckiest lottery, it'll hit somewhere on that red line. They're going to see in a very real and visceral way that's undeniable the possibilities in space and one of the reasons why we need to expand into it. But NASA doesn't just observe our own solar system. They also look, look farther out into space using tools like these. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. It's being launched in 2018. It's the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, which you may know better. The James Webb is three times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope, and while the Hubble orbits a couple hundred miles over the Earth, the James Webb is going to fly one million miles away from the Earth before it deploys its telescope and allow us to look farther back into the universe than ever before. And there's something important about that, looking farthest back at, farther back in the universe than ever before, that I'd like to talk about now for a bit. And it's one of the things that really attracts me to space. Because time travel is real, and it exists through telescopes like these. If the James Webb telescope is looking at something 100 light years away, what that means is that that light is taking 100 years to reach us. Put another way, James Webb is seeing that object as it existed 100 years ago. We are seeing into the past. Think about it this way. If there's someone out there pointing a telescope back at Earth 50 light years away from here, they would be able to look and watch as Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. And that dichotomy, the fact that space is both our future, is what we're going to expand into. It's where I see a lot of the possibilities of the human race. But also by expanding, by, by expanding our observation of it and looking at it, we can see into our own past. James Webb is going to allow us to see billions of years into the past, farther than we've ever been able to see before, back to the mere moments after creation of the universe and watch as galaxies and stars and, and solar systems form. And by watching this, we'll get glimpses of how all this came to be. And that's amazing to me. But while amazing, that's not why I joined NASA. And I joined NASA for one reason. And that can be summed up with Mars. My goal is I want it to be in the room when humans set foot on Mars. That is that's my number one goal in life. Um, and we're getting there. You may have seen this rover uh, in the news recently. This is the Mars rover Curiosity in what I think is the coolest self-portrait ever taken. This is Curiosity taking a picture of itself on Mars. <laughs> uh, the Curiosity rover is the size of a small car. It's the largest rover we've ever sent to another world. And if you have not seen the video of this guy landing, do yourself a favor and look it up soon. The Curiosity rover blasted through the Martian atmosphere at thousands of miles an hour, deployed a combination of parachutes and rockets to hover feet above its surface, and then lowered itself on a rope gently to the surface of Mars and caught it all on video. It is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. But as amazing as those rovers are, and they are amazing, they will always be the forefront of exploration. They will always be first. These rovers can accomplish, what these rovers accomplish in six months could be done with a human exploration team in less than a day. A previous rover, the Spirit rover, which you may have heard about as well, spent six years traveling around Mars and, walked for five, and uh, traveled for five miles. Humans could walk that in under a day. The end goal is humans on Mars. The amount of work they'll be able to do will dwarf anything, any rovers we've ever done in the past, and we're working on it, and I do, do believe that you will see it in your lifetime. But that being said, what I think the greatest discovery that you're also going to see during your lifetime is not going to be on Mars, but it's going to be on this, on this moon that you may not recognize. This is the moon Europa, and it orbits Jupiter. And if you are a planetary scientist, this moon is your holy grail. And it's your holy grail for one very simple reason. We think there's water there. Buried under a layer of ice, we think that we've detected a worldwide ocean 60 miles deep. Of all told, 
That ocean is twice as big as the oceans of the Earth, and it's warm due to the gravity of Jupiter pulling on it. <laughs> now getting there is going to be tough. You're going to need to land a spacecraft on the orbit. You're going to need to land a spacecraft um, on Europa, drill through miles of ice, and then deploy a submersible and see what's down there. It's going to be incredibly tough, but we're working on it now. There are engineering teams devising plans for this mission, and I do believe you're going to see it succeed during your lifetime. Now, while all this is, is far away, I have some other good news for you. The chances that anybody in this room can get involved in space is, is greater now than it ever has been in the past, and that's due to the fact that there is a space race booming around the world right now. It's a commercial space race. There are dozens of companies and hundreds of thousands of people involved in it. In 2003, the very first private astronaut ever was launched to space on a spaceship called Spaceship One, seen here. And he already has a place to go. The president of Budget Suites of America has already launched their space wing. They, are, they have built, launched, and tested hotels in orbit right now that are just waiting for people to get to them. But it's not just tourism. There's also merchant shipping. Uh, SpaceX is the very first functional merchant shipping line in space. They have launched paid missions delivering thousands of pounds of cargo to the International Space Station. But you'll have heard arguments pushing back against this sort of exploration. You'll have heard people saying that we shouldn't spend money on these long-term projects. We should spend it closer to home. In tough economic times, it's always the tendency to sacrifice the future for the benefit of the present. And there's a quote that really sums up my thoughts on this that I'd like to give to you now. It's by U.S. Senator Daniels, Daniel Webster, who served in the U.S. Congress in the 1800s. And here's the quote. I will not spend one cent, one dime, to the opening up of the American West, for it will always be a howling wilderness of no use to anybody. And there are people now who look up at space and see nothing but a howling emptiness that will never be of use to anybody. And they're as wrong now as he was then, as anybody here from California can attest to. Space is a place of almost limitless possibilities, and it's just waiting for us to get off the planet and go grab it. And thank you, and I hope you're as excited as I am. Yeah.